If we had one person to thank for the success of Harry Potter, I'm not talking about the story itself. I'm not talking about the books. I'm talking about the success, overall success of Harry Potter. If we had one person to thank, it would be John Williams. Hang on, I can't see shit. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the first official episode of I Used To Um, the series where I talk about how I used to um. And today we're going to talk about how I used to admire J.K. Rowling. I used to look up to this woman. I used to look up to her story, her success, the story that she wrote, but also the story of her life that led up to her success with Harry Potter. I adored this woman. I looked up to her like, like I wanted to be her pretty much. I wanted to be my own version of her. I wanted to be the next J.K. Rowling. Hang on, it's really hot. I'm gonna take these gloves off real quick. It's winter in Florida. It's not glove worthy. It's like 76 degrees outside right now. It's disgusting. I like the cold. I am a cold ass bitch. Let me take off some layers. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for tuning in. I wanna start off by saying this is a trans safe space. This is a trans positive space. We support trans lives here. Trans lives matter to us to me, not just the people that I have in my life who happen to be trans and matter a lot to me, but also just trans lives in general. You are all worthy of safety and love and happiness. If you're coming here because you're not sure about what the whole JK Rowling situation is, you heard that she said some things on Twitter, you heard that she's said some things online in regards to trans people, and you're like, what is a trans person? How does this affect anybody at all, this may not be the video for you. This is my experience with Harry Potter, my experience with JK Rowling as um, a figure that I um, was a fan of throughout my childhood, throughout my adolescence, and you know, into adulthood as well. So this may not be the video for you. You may benefit more out of Jammy Dodger's video, which discusses in length everything that J.K. Rowling said that was just abysmally wrong. Not just morally, but scientifically. Like, the data is just not there. I'm not equipped to speak on that though, and why would I when Jammy Dodger has an excellent video on it? Go ahead and watch that video when you're done with this one. I'll link it down below, don't worry, it's there. I promise. Hi, it's Editing Me. I just wanted to say that after I filmed my video, one of my favorite YouTubers, ContraPoints, came out with a video of her own about JK Rowling. So I'm adding this in so you can go check her video out as well. It will also be in the description. I wanted to say that if you are unaware of anything that's going on with trans people at all, if you're not aware of the importance of standing up for trans rights and the damage that JK Rowling is causing to the community, I would say watch Jamie Dodger's video first. His is much more beginner level than ContraPoints. So I would say watch his first and then ContraPoints. If you're more aware of what's going on, you can watch them in any order. I do recommend watching them both. You get two different perspectives, one from a trans man, one from a trans woman. So perfect. Listen to trans people. Don't just listen to this cis gay bitch right here, okay? There's plenty of voices that need to be amplified and need to be heard. So watch their videos first if you want, or you can watch them after mine. I don't mind. Just give them a watch. Give them a follow. They are awesome. All right, back to me. So before we get started on my experience with JK Rowling and Harry Potter, and clearly you can see I am a fan, let's go ahead and grab something to drink. This is going to be a long video, as I'm sure you've seen the timestamp. So I had to equip myself with some black iced coffee. It was iced, but the ice has melted. This is caramel macchiato flavored coffee. It was double poured over and it's got a shot of Cuban coffee and a dash of cookie dough skinny syrup. Grab yourself something to drink. Do you want coffee? Do you want tea? Do you want some water? It's fine. Go ahead and grab yourself something delicious and imbibe. And if it's alcoholic, listen, I won't judge. Another quick little thing that I like to do at the beginning of these videos is introduce the fragrance of the video. For me, a scent that represents magic and feels just magical on me is 
Bohemian Water by Alt Fragrances. This is a brand that makes mock-ups of designer perfumes. It is delicious. It is just absolutely magical. Hmm. Oh, I feel magical whenever I spray this and honestly, I love it. Get yourself a fragrance, go ahead and spritz something delicious on, something that you feel magical in. Let's go back to the very, very beginning before I even knew who JK Rowling was. Ah, <sighs> simpler times. Part one, the rise of Harry Potter. It was the night of December 1st, 2001. It was a Saturday night, like any other. I specifically remember I was sitting on my recliner. Was I on the recliner or was I on the sofa? Did we even have the recliner back then? I was sitting on the couch, my mom was ironing clothes, my sister and I were watching TV, just in our jammies, just chilling, just relaxed. What's funny is I specifically remember the pajamas that I was wearing. They weren't full on pajamas, it was like a, a little pajama shirt and old boxers that I think belonged to my dad and I wore as like shorts. That's how little I was. I was a little tiny kid. Now, I don't remember what we were watching on the TV, but I do remember that familiar knock on the door interrupting our little mundane evening that could have gone like any other evening if it wasn't for my godmother and her husband showing up and announcing, we're gonna go watch Harry Potter. Now, if you knew me as a child, you knew that I fucking loved my godmother. I still do but she was my favorite human being in the entire world. Like she would pop up randomly at our house, just like randomly just show up, be like, hi. And I would go crazy. I would be so happy. I would be just up insanely happy. When she would leave to go home, I would be devastated. I would cry for a good 15 to 20 minutes. I adored her as a child. <laughs> anyway, so you can imagine my joy at seeing my godmother just randomly show up. Now, when she said, we're gonna go watch Harry Potter, I had no idea what a Harry Potter was. All I knew was I was leaving the house with my godmother, my favorite human being in the entire planet. So I was like, hell yes, let's fucking go. So I got dressed super fast as did my sister, my mom, and hell, even my dad went along, which if you know my dad, he is not the most social butterfly. He's not any kind of butterfly. He's barely a caterpillar, but he went along. So before I continue a little bit of context, I wasn't 100% alien to the concept of Harry Potter. I knew that there was a book. And I remember that because my godmother had given my sister her copy of Sorcerer's Stone. It's even got a little dedication written just for us. It says, I hope you enjoy reading this book as much as I have. Love, my godmother, 2001. So she gave this to us right before the movie came out. You can see it is very, very well loved. So of course I still have this book. It's really the one that started it all for me and I cherish it. This is the most important book to me. I value this book more than any other book in my shelf. I such an emotional attachment to this particular edition. However, it wasn't an immediate grab for me. I wasn't just immediately hooked onto it. It was in my sister's room for a good while. It wasn't even in my room. This wasn't my book. My sister really was the one that was holding onto it. I think I had only read up to like the second or third chapter, if that. I don't really remember specifically how far I got into it before I went to see the movie. I know it wasn't that far because on our way to the theater, my godmother was asking us little like trivia questions on the book and she asked us who delivers Harry's mail. And me thinking I was smart, I was like, the mailman. And she was like, no, it's the owls. And I was like, owls. So we arrive at the mall where we're going to go see the movie. And if I remember correctly, there was a viewing that had just started. So there wasn't another viewing until like an hour. So we were walking around and I remember there was this like Christmas ornament store and it was super magical. Like it was all kinds of wizard looking ornaments. I don't know if it was a special thing for Harry Potter coming out, but it was so cool. I can say this now looking back on it, it looked like something that you would find in Dumbledore's office. It's not something that I would have thought back then because um, Dum I, I had never seen Dumbledore's office at that point. But now I'm like thinking back on it, I'm like these are really nice ornaments. They were like a deep blue and gold and there were, um, there were snow globes and they looked 
wizardly. They looked like they came from Harry Potter. Looking at those ornaments amped me up for Harry Potter, which is strange because I was eight years old, but it did. Like, I will be honest that that memory is very fuzzy, but I remember those ornaments. And I think I remember my godmother mentioning that they're Harry Potter ornaments. It was 2001, I was eight years old. And then we watched the movie. I was glued to that screen. I was eating all that fantasy up. I was, my brain, my imagination was nom nom nomming all the way through. It was amazing. Now for a little more context, I grew up already being a magic aficionado. I would watch like the David Copperfield specials on TV. I had a Lance Burton magic set growing up as well. I think I got him when I was six years old. I used that thing to death. <laughs> so I've always loved magic. And then of course, later on in life, Chris Angel came along and I was like, <laughs> but obviously that was all a different kind of magic. This. Harry Potter stuff, this was a completely different realm. It's who he was. This wasn't something that he practiced. This was something he was born. He didn't receive a magic set. He was told, you're a wizard. This is who you are. You're different from these people. And this is why you feel so different and alienated from the normal people in your life because you're not normal. You're a different kind of normal. And I related to that hard. Now, obviously, after growing up, I realized, oh, yeah, I'm not a wizard. I'm just gay. But as a kid, I didn't know about sexuality. I didn't know anything. I just liked magic. So I thought, I'm a wizard, too. So this magic was something that was within all of the witches and wizards. And I loved that. I found myself in that. Harry found his home, and I found my home right along with him. Hogwarts became my home. Hogwarts and the Wizarding World, mainly Hogwarts. Hogwarts just became my escape in my mind. I remember actually, I'm remembering now, I was a fan of Harry Potter along with my friends in like elementary school and middle school, but I was such a huge fan. I would assign my teachers, like which teacher would be which teacher. Like I knew which of my teachers would be Professor McGonagall. I knew which one of my teachers would be Snape. I'm sure I'm not the only one that did that, but I, I'm remembering that now very vividly. Also a funny little anecdote, while we were watching the movie at the theater, I really had to pee. And it was during the big chess scene that my godmother took me to the bathroom because she had already seen the movie. I've never seen the big chess scene in theaters. I only saw it when I got the VHS when it came out and we bought it at, um, FYE. Ten times. I still have that VHS, by the way. All right, so movie's over. We get home super late. It's like past midnight. I was a little kid, so my sleep schedule wasn't as messed up as it is now. But we get home super late. I knock out, wake up the next morning, breakfast is ready, and I sit down and I try to summon the fork like Harry summoned his broom. That should go to show just how instantly hooked I was in the realm of Harry Potter. After that movie, I could not get enough of the story. So I dove right into the book. I was like, wait a minute. If that's the movie, I gotta check out this book now. Which is an interesting point to note. The book itself didn't get me into Harry Potter. It was the movie that got me into the Harry Potter books. And as much as this story belongs to JK Rowling, the movie wasn't just her. It took a hell of a lot of people to make that movie. So it took a hell of a lot of people to get me into Harry Potter. And JK Rowling so happened to be one of them. Just saying. So fast forward a bit and my godmother is seeing us loving Harry Potter, or rather seeing me loving Harry Potter and seeing my sister be less and less interested in Harry Potter. <laughs> and she gives us her copy of Chamber of Secrets dedicated to both of us. She wrote, Harry Potter's adventure continues. Have fun reading about them. Love, godmother. And you can see that this one is also very, very, battered and very, very loved. And then by the time she gives us Prisoner of Azkaban, which was also her copy, she only dedicated it to me. And she wrote, to a person who loves Harry Potter as much as I do, hope you like this book so much as the first two books. And she gave us this one in 2002. This one doesn't have a date on it. it this one might have come along in 2001 as well. I'm not sure. By this time, I was a full on Harry Potter fan. I was Harry Potter for Halloween one year. I picked up Quidditch Through the Ages and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them when I saw them at Walden Books. I was like, holy shit, I didn't know these books existed. So I picked them up and I felt like I was at Hogwarts with my little Hogwarts books. And I also saw the collector's edition of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets at Walden Books. 
and it was $75 and I was like, mom, you know, $75 isn't that much, you know? And she was like, no. I would also just talk endlessly about Harry Potter with my friends who happened to see the movie, even if they hadn't read the books. And I would fill them in on the details from the books. And I would just read every, any, anything and everything Harry Potter related. I had Harry Potter magazines. I had Harry Potter coloring books. I had the action figures. My cakes for my birthdays were all Harry Potter themed. They could never put Hagrid on the cake because it was such a huge fucking figurine. But yeah, there was always Harry Potter in my birthday parties. <laughs> always. Also, my book reports for school usually always had something to do with Harry Potter. I would write the book report on Chamber of Secrets, on Sorcerer's Stone. I even ended up writing a book report on Quidditch Through the Ages and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Don't ask me how I did it. I managed and I got an A. And so as the years went on, the books came out, the movies came out, and as the world continued to grow, both literarily and cinematically, my love for it just kept on growing. I grew up not just with Harry Potter in my life, but I grew up alongside Harry Potter. Every year as he went along in his studies in, in, in college, <laughs> in his studies in Hogwarts, I went along with my own studies and I felt like I was studying along with him. I felt like I was growing along with him. Sure, looking at back at the books now, there's a whole lot of plot, but in school, being a student in school, there isn't really a whole lot of plot there either. So I felt like I was living in a book myself in a JK Rowling book, albeit, but I felt like I was living in Harry Potter. I felt like I was living in his world, his world, not JK Rowling's world. By this point, the wizarding world was in my head, beyond her pages, even beyond the movies, it was in me. But at some point I did realize that Harry Potter wasn't just born of the void, it had to come from somebody. And that's when I started noticing the name on the books. I was like, oh wait, who's GK? Rowling. So I knew the name JK Rowling, but I didn't know much about this mystery witch. Now, since I was a pre high speed internet child of the early 2000s, I had to kind of wait to see what information I would glean from her from like TV specials that would be made of her and like TBS or Discovery. They would make like these specials on JK Rowling and on her life. And I would watch these with my mom and that's how I learned that she wrote Harry Potter on scraps of napkins. Like the beginnings of it was written on napkins on a cafe. And she was a single mother and she was struggling and she was hungry and they were hungry and they were sad and depression. The depression inspired the Dementors. And I thought, oh my God, this woman took her suffering. And even as a child, I could see that she took her suffering and turned it into art, turned it into a story, turned it into creatures that would suck your happiness out of you. And it was just such an inspiration to see her succeed even beyond all of this shit <laughs> that she dealt with. And in my head, if this woman with nothing to her name, no money, no fame, nothing to her name, but a story, if she could make it, then maybe this kid in old adult boxers that he wore as pajama shorts could make it. So really JK Rowling inspired me to write story after story of my own in like fifth and sixth grade and seventh grade. And I actually still have some of those saved in a hard drive somewhere. Yeah, I, I do still have some of those saved and they're cringy, but they're fun to look back on. <laughs> but for young me, they were my life's work. They were like, Mwah. I wrote a story. I did a thing. Hooray. But JK Rowling, I, I know her. I am her now that I've written a story in sixth grade. So the most prolific of these stories was a series that in a nutshell was a mashup fanfic combining the worlds of Kill Bill and the 2005 cinematic masterpiece Bewitched. Oh, and Chris Angel shows up in there too. Anyway, I've gone way off topics. Fast forward a little further into my adulthood now, shall we? Obviously, child me loved Harry Potter endlessly all the way up to the end of the series, to what we all believed would be the end of the series, the end of Harry Potter. I experienced it from the very beginning, from my very beginning, 
up until his very end. I was sad that it was over, but happy that it happened. And even though the story was done being told, I knew it was one that I would always return to and I would always feel at home returning to, whether it was in the books, or in the movies, or in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter itself, which is in Orlando. It's about a skip away from me. I live about four hours away from Orlando. It's not that bad. I can go whenever I want. I've been there three times already, by the way. It's so, so beautiful. I love it every time I go. The best time to go, by the way, is the winter, because then you can wear all this and not feel like you're dying in the Florida heat. Also, hot butterbeer is literally the best one out of all of them, and I don't give a fuck. Part two. The Wizarding World Renaissance. So let's go back to 2011. I mean, let's not, but like, let's recall where Harry Potter was in 2011. The eighth movie just came out. J.K. Rowling said she's not going to be writing any more Harry Potter related stuff. Harry Potter was done. It was in her past. She's done with Harry Potter, basically. And I understood that, right? Even though I was sad that Harry Potter was over, I understood that she was an artist and she had to move on. One story was over, the next one will come along, naturally. So the last movie just came out. We're all collectively feeling our childhood end. And funnily enough, it was that same year that I was starting college. Literally the summer after Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two came out. So the world was feeling a little extra daunting. Am I right, folks? My childhood is literally ending because I'm starting college. My childhood is also figuratively ending because the world of Harry Potter is coming to an end. I was like, uh, the world is scary and I want to go part of it. But no matter how scary the world got, I always knew I had Harry Potter. I had the fond memories of my childhood to just reminisce on. I had a world to dive myself back into if anything got a little too scary. It's like, you know what? At least there's magic in this world and I can bring some magic out of it and bring some magic into my world. Even if it's just a little hint of feeling magical. So I knew I would always have a little corner in my heart dedicated to Harry Potter. But what about JK? Well, she had said she wasn't going to write anything more about Harry Potter, and I respected that. In fact, a year after the last Harry Potter movie came out, she published The Casual Vacancy. And I, under the presumption that because I'm a Harry Potter fan, I am automatically a J.K. Rowling fan, I went ahead and I bought the book. And it sat on my shelf for a year. And then I started reading it, and I don't think I got past the second page. Yeah, I was bored. Bored as fuck. I didn't go into it expecting another Harry Potter, by the way. I knew this was going to be a completely different story, completely different world. But it just didn't captivate me at all. Her writing just felt different. Like, it wasn't the same as when she was writing Harry Potter. It was it just felt alien. It's like eating a slice of pizza from a place that you've never been, and you're like, okay, I know what pizza tastes like, and then you bite into it, and you're like, how do you mess up pizza? At that moment, I was like, oh shit. Harry Potter ended, and J.K. Rowling ended with it. And I'm pretty sure J.K. Rowling felt the same way, because not too long after that, she went back on what she said, and just started posting Harry Potter stuff on her Twitter, on Pottermore, which kept on going and growing. I remember when Pottermore originally started, you were supposed to just experience the Harry Potter experience alongside the books, and then somehow it changed. I don't know. All I know is I was a Ravenclaw. So yeah, she just kept the world kind of going with these little tweets that no one really asked for. And then Cursed Child happened, and I know for sure no one in this reality asked for it. This would not have happened in the Berenstein universe. Now speaking of Cursed Child, I didn't immediately read it because it didn't look like a Harry Potter book. It didn't feel like a Harry Potter book. Even from looking at it on the shelves at Barnes & Noble, I was like, this is weird. This is really weird. She said she wasn't going to continue it. This feels forced. It feels pushed. I kept hearing awful things about it too. Awful things that just kept deterring me from reading it. Now, by this time, I was still a Harry Potter fan. I would still wear a Hogwarts shirt. Anybody asked, I'm a Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw. But this new Harry Potter story, which had JK Rowling's name on it, along with two others, just didn't feel right. I waited until I reread the series at the end of 2018. I started rereading the entire Harry Potter series when I went to the Wizarding World with my mom and my sister, and I actually reread them from the uh, the British editions because I'm 
I'm that fan. I have different editions of the Harry Potter books that I've collected throughout the years. And it wasn't until I finished rereading the series that I actually read Cursed Child. And Jesus H. Christ, what did they do to this franchise? That script read like a fanfic. In fact, give 12 year old me the rights to this script and I would have written a better story that would not have completely obliterated the essence of these characters, of the main characters. Granted, 12 year old me would have probably mashed it with Kill Bill and the 2005 cinematic masterpiece Bewitched, but honestly compared to what we've got, would it have been that much worse? So yeah, Cursed Child is cursed and then Oh yeah, Fantastic Beasts. I haven't seen those movies, not a single one. I'm not saying that proudly, I'm just saying it as I have not seen them and I don't really want to. By this point in my life, I enjoyed Harry Potter, I enjoyed the Wizarding World, but I felt no need to travel back in time to the 1920s when these heifers were still wearing cloaks in the 1990s. Clearly not much else could have been different 70 years ago. Was it by the second Fantastic Beasts movie that J.K. Rowling had already retconned most of her entire story. Something about werewolves representing AIDS and Hogwarts students shitting themselves because toilets were muggle inventions and only then were they like, oh wow, look, I'm plumbing. I mean, for one, you would have thought they would have said the same thing about like electricity. You mean they took plumbing from the muggles, but not electricity. And two, the Chamber of Secrets was built into the plumbing of Hogwarts. Hogwarts was built before muggles invented plumbing. Are you telling me these kids were shitting themselves for nothing? Jesus. Again, I'm going a bit off topic here, but you get the point, right? The big renaissance that the Wizarding World could have had has all been retrospective. And the one story that we actually get in the present tense is such garbage that we don't even consider a canon. I don't consider a canon. That's not Harry Potter. That's not... No, it's not a Harry Potter story, period. And it has JK Rowling's name on it, and we still don't want it. By the time I read Cursed Child, I wasn't a naive little child that couldn't even pronounce JK Rowling's name, okay? I was an adult, and I saw it for what it was, money. JK Rowling would rather inflate the shit out of the Harry Potter franchise just to inflate her shitty bank account. <sighs> Imagine a world where Harry Potter actually ended with Deathly Hallows part two, where Rowling moved on to something else that actually brought her success or where she actually just settled with her riches for the rest of her British life. Or at the very least continued writing actually good stories taking place in the Wizarding World, but not having anything to do with Harry Potter. Not having to travel back in time to see what other characters were like 70 years ago, but give us an entirely new story set in the present tense, set in the present day or even the future. Give us a different story, different characters, different lives. For example, a love story between a witch and a muggle. Dear God, God if you say Seamus's parents. Or something even more adult, like a wizarding drug cartel. Are you telling me there aren't Felix Felice's dealers in the wizarding world? How many of those incarcerated in Azkaban are imprisoned for petty crimes like potion dealing? There are so many important real world scenarios that JK Rowling could explore in this fantasy world. And you can't say she hasn't done it already because she did. Um, hello, wizard Nazis. But alas, that is what happens when someone gets so rich, they don't need to be creative anymore. They forget how to be creative because they don't need to be creative in order to get rich. They don't need to actually try to be creative in order to succeed because Anything with her name will make her money now. So she was able to put her name onto Cursed Child, send it off. It made her millions. It's fine. It created jobs. That's nice. But it's garbage. It's garbage. And then, then, after all that, she has the gall to be transphobic. Part three, you're a turf, Joanne. I'm pretty sure that by now the whole world knows about her transphobic tweets, but again, if you don't know about him, check out Jamie Dodger's video. It is in the link below. I highly recommend it. He goes through absolutely all of it. But if you're part of the majority of people who do know about them, then you're either absolutely disgusted by what she's been saying, or you're on board with her. And for your sake, I really hope it's the former and not the latter. Now, at the time, these tweets felt so 
out of place. Like, how could the author of such a fantastical place where yes, magic exists, but love conquers all. Love conquers death itself. How could she be such a fucking bigot? How could she spout this bigoted nonsense? Like, I thought she was relatively woke. Like, yeah, she made Dumbledore gay retroactively, where she didn't have to literally write him as gay. Long past the point where she wasn't required to explicitly make him gay in any of the stories. She wasn't obligated to explicitly state in the stories that the greatest wizard of all time was gay. She didn't have to make it a point in the story other than giving him a pink bonnet once. And now here's another way that the story of the Wizarding World could have continued in a real life scenario. Does the Wizarding World have the same heteronormative society as muggles do? If so, how unmagical is that? And also, would the magic of a gay wizard be that different where he could rise up to be the greatest wizard of all time? They went from celebrating their difference from the muggles to intercultural bigotry, just like those fucking gays that are like, remove the T from LGBT. I'm part of the LGB community. Honestly, even after we have pride, thanks to the work of trans women of color, honestly, if you're one of those gays, um, yeah, fuck you. But anyway, as I had said before, I had reread the Harry Potter series starting in 2018 in my adult life. And I, being a gay man, kept my eyes peeled for any kind of coding written into Dumbledore's character. Any hint of gayness towards Dumbledore, any hint of his romantic relationship with Grindelwald in the text. And honestly, I got nothing. I got nothing. There was more subtext between Dean Thomas and Seamus Finnegan. Hell, there was more subtext between Harry Potter and the Sorting Hat than there ever will be with Grindelwald and Dumbledore. Ever. And more than there ever will be because remember how Fantastic Beast is like prequel storytelling to Harry Potter? Dumbledore's there and so is Grindelwald and guess what? They're not gay in the movie. She had the chance to make them gay to give them an actual meaningful on-screen relationship, actual representation, and it still didn't happen. I guess Dumbledore's only gay in theory and not in practice. Maybe he's a eunuch. I don't know, the turf won't tell us. Which speaking of which, back to the topic at hand. JK Rowling is the exact definition of what turf stands for. Trans exclusionary radical feminist. Someone who so vehemently believes themselves to be so adamantly feminist that they only include people who were born women. And I'm sure if you're like me, you're asking yourself, wait, does that include trans men? You tell them about a trans man, they're like, oh, that's just a confused lesbian. Bitch, there are gay trans men. Shut up. Trans women are women. Trans men are men. Non-binary folks are awesome. Well, everybody's awesome. All of the above are awesome. But you get what I mean. Also, not really a hot take, but only real feminists include trans women in their fight for equality for women and in the fight against misogyny. Because really, when you're fighting trans women, you're obsessing over the emasculation of men. And you're also identifying this idea of, oh, they're just men in women's clothing, which they're not. They're literally changing their bodies to be women. They're not out to get you. They're just trying to live their life. So circling back to my history with Rowling's works and my admiration for her once upon a time, when I saw these tweets, I found it relatively easy to just cut ties with her real quick. And at first I thought it was just the transphobia that made me like, okay, I don't wanna deal with this bitch anymore. I don't like her anymore. I don't like what she's saying. I don't. I don't stand by that. I thought it was just that, but it wasn't until I started writing this very script that I realized just how strained my relationship with her had already become. I hadn't read her new book. I was laughing at all the memes of her coming up with shit for Harry Potter retroactively, like Snape being a single mother or Dobby liking getting double fisted. By the time she came out as a turf, I was honestly already done with her. I wasn't done with Harry Potter. But I was already done with her. My only tie to her was my love for Harry Potter and my love for the Wizarding World. And especially the theme park because it's so 
beautiful. Every time I go, it's just fantastic. And even then, I go over there and I don't think about her. I think about everybody else who worked on this theme park, who worked at the theme park and brings it to life. But aside from that, even though I still loved Harry Potter and I still loved the Wizarding World, J.K. Rowling was a fucking joke. She was done. She took what could have been a perfectly ended, perfectly wrapped franchise and kept adding more and more and doing more and bringing more and making herself more to the point where I just started blocking out her nonsense and just focused on the original books, the original story, the movies, and anything else that would come out, I'd be like, oh, oh, there's another one? Oh, no, I, I haven't seen it yet. I, no, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll watch it eventually. And I never do. So really, I had one foot out the door. You might even say I had a one and three quarters. <laughs> I was ready to dip, okay? And then the transphobic tweets, yeah, I hopped right off the Rolling Express. It wasn't that dangerous. It was moving at a crawl at that point. Like that wine tasting train on Bob's Burgers. Hi, Ramon. What? Now I have to give credit where credit is due. Yes, JK Rowling is the primary reason that I got into reading. But, and this is a big but, like song worthy, big ass. I was fortunate enough to have a family that encouraged reading from a really, really early age. I remember getting entry level reading books for my kindergarten and first grade graduation and just reading them over and over. So I really always liked reading to begin with. So ultimately, if it wasn't Harry Potter, it would have been another book. It would have been another author. In fact, into my adolescence, I got more into Stephen King. And Stephen King ended up superseding J.K. Rowling as my favorite author over time. So if it wasn't her, it would have been Stephen King. It would have been somebody else. Harry Potter just so happened to encapsulate all of these things that I loved and just ate up. I loved magic. I loved castles. I loved trains. And I loved the Hogwarts Express. I loved the old antiquated aesthetic. I've always loved antiques. It all just fell together so perfectly that the world that it created was my aesthetic. I felt at home just for the style of the world that I would see in the movies. Because if you read the books, it's not described the same as it is in the movies. <sighs> JK Rowling wasn't special. She just got lucky. I'm not saying the story is trash, even though there are elements to it in the later books that I'm like wondering how much of her talent started getting swallowed up by her ego. But I am saying that without the movies, her books would have easily been forgotten. Easily. Take for example, Percy Jackson. And if you're watching this and you're a Percy Jackson fan, please don't take offense. This isn't meant to shit on Percy Jackson as a series, but I'm sure you know what I'm about to start talking about here. <laughs> I saw the movie first, thinking it would be another Harry Potter, thinking I'd watch the movie and be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get into the books right after. I wasn't captivated by it at all. And to this day, I still haven't read the books. Granted, I'm not that into Greek mythology, but the movie painted the wrong picture in my head. So go back to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone and imagine if that movie got the same treatment. If they had gotten a different director, a different cast, a different stylization of the story, so much as a different composer, which, okay, speaking of, this may be an actual hot take, but if we had one person, if we had one person to thank for the success of Harry Potter, I'm not talking about the story itself. I'm not talking about the books. I'm talking about the success, overall success of Harry Potter. If we had one person to thank, it would be John Williams. I can't see your reaction right now, but you know it's true. And I'll, I can prove it. I can flash you an image of Daniel Radcliffe right now. And maybe you feel a little hint of nostalgia, right? You're looking at him. You're like, oh my God, I remember seeing him growing up. Oh, my heart went. But suppose I dim the light cut the background music, and then... Aha! Goosebumps! Instant goosebumps! I don't think there's anything in those seven books combined that compares to John Williams' score for that first Harry Potter movie and the 
second one after and even the third one too. And I'm not trying to shit on all the wonderful people that worked on these movies, because listen, Hogwarts looks beautiful. The scenes are shot brilliantly. Costumes, the wardrobe, the makeup, it all looks amazing. Beautiful. In fact, I remember I was watching a video by Nerd Stalgic where he was talking about how people may have their least favorite Harry Potter movie, but there isn't a single bad Harry Potter movie. Like they were all expertly made. And I completely agree with that. They were all expertly made. Yeah, we all have our least favorite. Oh, hello. Yeah, we all have our least favorite, but even the least favorite Harry Potter movie is good. It's competently made for the most part. Remember that clock thing in the fifth movie? What the fuck? That looks, that looks like shit. What I'm trying to say is everyone involved in the making of these Harry Potter movies did a great, beautiful, amazing job. And to have it all come together with the right music? Chef's kiss. There is a reason why when you go to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, what you hear in the background is always the music. That's what you hear blasting in every single corner of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. You hear the score blasting. I mean, it's not blasting, it's like in the background, but it's always there, always. And it is beautiful. It's amazing. That's what really sucks you into the world. You could be in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter walking around in dead silence and you're not gonna feel anything. You're gonna be looking at these buildings and be like, okay, oh look, there's the dragon. <laughs> but the music, the score, the soundtrack, that is home. That is that feeling of home, of just, of magic that you don't get in the books. You wouldn't get it in the movies if it wasn't for John Williams. And you wouldn't be feeling what you feel now if it wasn't for that music. You wouldn't. Wasn't there a scene in Percy Jackson where they were playing Poker Face by Lady Gaga? I love Lady Gaga. But Poker Face by Lady Gaga in Percy Jackson? Imagine Harry flying on Buckbeak's back to Break Away by Kelly Clarkson. I think I made my point. Now there's still one last question. Part four, where do I stand with Harry Potter? I've seen a lot of people have different takes on this and honestly, none of them are wrong. There's people who have completely just separated themselves from Harry Potter entirely, not buying anything, not supporting J.K. Rowling at all. And that's valid, that's amazing. That is perfectly fine. There's people who are still buying Harry Potter things, not the official merchandise, but they're buying like fan-made things. They're supporting small artists who dedicate themselves to creating fan work of Harry Potter, fan art of Harry Potter, and that works too. They've distanced themselves from JK Rowling and they don't wanna support JK Rowling anymore, but they love Harry Potter so much that they wanna support small artists. There's other people who are still buying Harry Potter stuff, like the official merch, but what they do is they match their purchase of Harry Potter things to a trans rights organization. Now where I stand is kind of in between. I don't wanna support JK Rowling anymore at all. However, because I collect the books and I still have a collection of Harry Potter books that's kind of incomplete, I still need to finish collecting the Ravenclaw house editions that were coming out like every other year or so. I have the last two left. So what I'm going to do is when I buy those last two, I'm going to match the donation to the Marsha P. Johnson Institute, which I'll go ahead and link down below so that you can support the Marsha P. Johnson Institute. Other than that, once those two are out and I have them, I'm not gonna buy anything else. I'm not going to support JK Rowling anymore. At most what I'll do is visit the Wizarding World of Harry Potter when I end up going because I do, I do love going to the Wizarding World. And even then, I will only go if I can match whatever I buy, even down to the tickets. I will match it to trans rights organizations. I feel like I'm obligated to do that. I cannot stand behind a woman who is saying these awful things, behind a person who is spouting such hatred and such bigotry and such uninformed nonsense. I can't be supporting that. 
I don't want to support that. But Harry Potter, it's my childhood. It's such a love that I have for this world that I, I'm, I am still torn by it. And I hate her statements. Is there a silver lining though? Is it possible for her to go back on what she says? Yes. I think there is a chance that she can, can learn from people who are calling her out on it. At the moment, she's not. And that's the problem. It's her ego shutting down anybody who is against her. But I think it is possible that she can go back on it. Now, if I'm gifted any Harry Potter stuff from people who know that I love Harry Potter, I'll thank them for it. I'll accept the gift because I know that it comes from a good place. And I know that they know that I love Harry Potter. Even though I'm not supporting, I know that they bought it officially and then I'll feel kind of bad. I might actually end up donating on their behalf. But until she comes to the realization that what she's saying is wrong, which I do think is possible. I mean, hell, if she can turn this like children's book into an entire franchise, I'm sure she can wake up to the fact that trans people need to pee. But until then, I definitely won't be supporting any of her newer works. Which brings me to something that I purposefully didn't mention earlier. At some point in this strange reality, JK Rowling decided to write a mystery thriller series under the pen name Robert Galbraith. I happen to have three of those books in my possession. I had seen a video on YouTube talking about how it felt like Harry Potter as an adult, how the books were like really good. So I thought, okay, I'll go ahead and buy them. I didn't buy them at like the original price though. I got them at like very low discount bargain prices because again, the emotional connection wasn't there like it is with Harry Potter, but I wanted to give it a shot. This was before the tweets, obviously, but I wanted to give her new books a shot, just like I tried with Casual Vacancy. But that one I did buy full price and I regret doing that. Now, I have not read them yet. I just, I had them there waiting on cue. And I was going to, and I don't know if you can see my disdain in even talking about them. And if you think it's because of the latest Corcoran Strike book where the villain is basically a man dressing as a woman in order to try to kill women, which is the whole transphobic logic behind trans women is that trans women are just men dressing up as women to be predators. That's not the only thing that ticks me off about these books. My hatred for these books comes from the choice that JK Rowling made for the author's name. If you don't know about it by now, go ahead and Google Robert Galbraith Heath. Yeah, when I found out, I was disgusted. I was shaking with rage. I was just flabbergasted that I even bought these books, even at discount prices. I was, I was disgusted and I still am. Allegedly, she had no idea about the well-known person that her pen name so happened to share a name with. And if JK Rowling's publicist just so happens to be watching this video, I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. That is bullshit, and you know it. Because I, as a teenager, as a fanfic writing teenager, mixing the worlds of Kill Bill and the 2005 cinematic masterpiece Bewitched, I came up with my own pen name as a child. And what was the first thing that I did? I Googled it! To see if anybody else already had the name. To see if anybody else was sharing the same name that I came up with. Even though it was an impossible name to share, I had to look it up anyway. I had to know that there wasn't at least one unknown comic book artist that shared the name with me. I had to know. It's what professionals do. And I was treating my little shitty fanfics as professional serious novels, by the way. It's what professionals do. Katy Perry had to change her name because there was already a Kate Hudson. And that's an actor. Katy Perry wasn't an actor. She was a singer. I mean, she still is. But she changed her name because there's already a Kate Hudson. She did her homework. JK. So don't you think that this professional author who is known for including 
ancient prolific names like Nicholas Flamel, who's known for her in-depth research into this world of Harry Potter, into the magical world, so much so that she includes actual Latin in her spells and actual potion ingredients that were written in like alchemy and shit. She did all of this research. And I remember because I watched those one hour specials on TV with my mom talking about the actual history behind Harry Potter. And it's fascinating that she included so much actual history in Harry Potter. Don't you think that she would have had the tiniest amount of common sense to Google the name Robert Galbraith and see that this man was the man who pioneered gay conversion therapy? Fuck you, J.K. Rowling. Do better. Do better than saying, Oh, I didn't mean to. Oh, it was an accident. Ooh, ooh. We're not eating up your bullshit anymore. We're done with your bullshit. And when that came out, Oh, I saw red. If you can retcon the entire plot of Chamber of Secrets over one septic tweet insisting that Hogwarts students would shit themselves because plumbing didn't exist, you can pull Robert Galbraith off the shelves of every Barnes and Noble and every bookstore in the world and change the fucking name. You can. You just don't want to. I'd say change it to your name, but your name hasn't really carried much weight since 2011, has it? Mm. At the very least, apologize. Don't just say, oh, I didn't know. Well, bitch, now you know. What are you gonna do about it? Change it. If you were a true ally, as you say you are, by making Dumbledore gay and making the werewolves representative of people who have AIDS, if you call yourself an ally, then you would be as fucking disgusted as I was when I found out. And don't you think somebody should have told you? Don't you think anybody could have told you? Or are you just surrounded by yes men who just say, yes, JK Rowling, yes, that's an amazing idea. Yes, 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 JK. Right, cursed child. Absolutely shit all over your characters. Use the shit that all of your Hogwarts students used to shit in their pants because there weren't any plumbing. Because there weren't any toilets in Hogwarts. Even though the Chamber of Secrets entrance is in a fucking toilet. <sighs> Unacceptable, JK Rowling. Unacceptable. Coming from someone who used to love you who used to kiss the ground you stepped on, the ground might as well swallow you up until you apologize. Until you change the name. Until you come to your senses and you realize that spouting false information about trans people is detrimental to trans lives. Is hurting people. Real people. And if you say that you have trans friends, don't you think you'd want them safe? That you'd want them not being hurt by the awful things that you're saying? Or are they just more yes men? Tagging along to see what scraps of money fall out of your pockets. You need some integrity in your life. JK Rowling. You need to come to your fucking senses. Because I'm not supporting you anymore. Especially not Robert Galbraith. Anyway, this has taken a long time to record. I think I've been recording for like two hours now. What is your perspective on JK Rowling and her transphobic tweets? I am excited to know. Go ahead and leave a comment down below. Let me know what your experience with Harry Potter, with the Wizarding World, with Hogwarts is. How far into the fanaticism of it did you go? Or have you gone? Or do you still go? It's okay to still be a Harry Potter fan. <sighs> I'm just not sure it's still okay to be a JK Rowling fan. Anyway, I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for watching till the end. I don't know how long this video is gonna be. The sun was shining when I started and now it's not. So 
Anyway, my battery is at 16% on my camera. I'm surprised it lasted this long. Thank you again for watching. Go ahead and leave a like down below if you liked this video and if you wanna see more I used to um series. Let me know how you feel about everything that I just said in a comment down below. It is also worth listening to more trans voices. Don't just listen to me, a cis gay. Listen to the trans people who are actually endangered by what she's saying and by what people who are like her are saying. She's just amplifying all of the bigotry that trans people have tried so hard to fight against. And here she is just shitting all over it. <sighs> it's atrocious. Anyway, have yourself a wonderful day. I hope to see you again in the next installment of I Used To Um, where I talk about how I used to... Um... I'm dying in this, by the way. I'm absolutely dying in this. Oh, hi. Is that the Ravenclaw glove? Yeah, it is. If this is my first impression of you, I want you to know that I go all out at all times. Wow, oh wow, these are dirty. Wingardium Leviosar, bitch. It is January in Florida. You would think, oh yes, I'm protected from the cold. There is no cold to protect in Florida. Um, Rowena Ravenclaw said trans rights. Also, she said that top is tacky. She did. It's hot. <sighs> I'm tired, y'all.